Many undervalue this book today, counting it as unnecessary, outdated, and even untrue. But the truth of the matter is it's only within the pages of the Bible that we find all the information we need to live our best life in this broken and fallen world. And it's only through the information that comes from this book that we can receive eternal life in the perfection of heaven. This is the More God, Less Me podcast. My name is Justin Lee, and today I just want to talk to you about the Bible. And while it's so important that you have your own relationship with God's Word, you need the Bible. If that's all that you get from this entire podcast, I hope you can get it right here from the beginning, is that you need the Bible. You need what is in this book. You need to have a relationship with it. No matter who you are, you need this book. Like I said, it's the only way to be saved. It's only in this book that we find the plan of salvation. You may be told that there are other plans of salvation. You may be told someday in the near future that there's another Jesus, but it's only in this Bible that we're able to get the entire truth. And not this specific Bible that I'm holding, of course, because any Bible that's in a good translation, which is a very important part, but any Bible, the Bible that you have, the Bible that's on your phone, is the Bible that you need, is the Bible that you need the relationship with. You need God's Word in your life. And the amazing thing is, is that God's Word is still alive and active. God can lead us to things in this Bible that answer the questions that we have need of. But we have to be willing to open it, to read it, and to focus on it. We need the Bible. And so much of what we need can be found in the Bible today. This isn't an outdated book, and it's not unnecessary. The simple truth of the matter is, is that we still need God's Word, and that we can learn things from God's Word that are so applicable in our lives. There are things in here that the first time I read them honestly shocked me, because there are answers to things and like lessons in the Bible that you wouldn't expect to be there. And one of which always sticks out to me comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. And so it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 2, where Solomon writes, Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what disaster may happen on earth. And so what he's saying is that you should divide out your money, your finances, what you're doing, because you don't know what's going to happen. He says in other places that you should send out your crops on two ships. When when you're sending things out, send them out on two ships, because one ship could have something befall it. It could get taken. It could sink. Anything could happen. And so if you divide, you're going to have a better portfolio. Well, my goodness, that's exactly what we're told today. How many financial YouTube channels and all these things are telling you to diversify your portfolio, to put a little money here, a little bit of money there, because you don't know what's going to happen? But the Bible was telling us that thousands of years before a real stock market even ever existed, the Bible was able to tell us that. And the Bible even tells us the interpersonal workings of people. And I think one funny example of that still dealing on the concept of money comes to us in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 7 where it says one pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. That's a pretty interesting thing to think about, and I think we see that in our world. Some of the richest people in our world today don't live as though they're rich. Warren Buffett is a great example of that. I always laugh that he would buy his McDonald's order based on what the stock market was doing, even as a billionaire. If the Dow was down, he was buying a cheaper meal at McDonald's. The man could buy the McDonald's. But that's how some rich people act. And there are poor people who pretend to be rich, who have the newest things and stuff like that, yet they never have any money. And the Bible is able to tell us that, and it's something that sticks with us through history. But that's not the only thing that the Bible does, and these are only just a couple examples. If you go back, even into the Old Testament, you begin to read books like Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, the Psalms, you read these books from the Bible, the wisdom literature, you're going to gain so much wisdom about how our world still works and operates today, and even the interpersonal working and relationships. But it's not just that. The Bible goes further, because we know that God's all-knowing, and God is all-powerful, and God can see into the future. He knows the end of the story. And why I think that is so impressive and so amazing is the fact that God has answered questions that we are still asking today, questions that we're trying to understand. God has given us the answers for it. And one of my favorite things to point in that is there's a lot of people that live their lives today and they want to think, well, I'm a good person, right? So so God should save me regardless of if I do this or if I do that because I'm good. But the Bible shows us that that's not actually true, that there is a plan of salvation and that we need to live that way. And we see that 
in Acts chapter 10, in the account of Cornelius. And I just want to read to you how Cornelius is described in this book. And so it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man, who feared God with all of his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Well, by all accounts, that sounds like a great person. That sounds like a person, really, in a lot of our minds, that would be saved. But what's interesting is that God said that wasn't enough. And God came to Cornelius and said, Cornelius, you need to send for a man named Peter, and he's going to explain things to you more and better. And what happens is Peter comes, Peter begins to preach to them about Jesus, the Holy Ghost falls, they all get baptized in Jesus' name, and now Cornelius is saved. Cornelius needed the Acts 2.38 message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He needed to hear, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Apparently, God saw that message as so important that he even went to a man who was living a good life like Cornelius and said, you need Peter. You need this person to bring you the word and to bring you the truth so that you and your entire household might be saved. What a truth. What a message that God is telling us. God is answering that question of like, well, am I going to be saved just because I'm a good person? As rough as it can sound to our ears, it's not the message we want to hear, but no, we have to obey God's word. We have to live out God's word. And in the Bible, we are given the plan of salvation. We are given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We're given what we need to do in order to be saved. It's not just praying a prayer but it's living in faith and obedience to God's word, being baptized, receiving the Holy Ghost, having a moment of repentance before those things take place. That's what it's going to take to be saved. And God answers questions like that for us in the Bible. And I'm going to pivot into something that's a little bit more difficult, but I think that it's another one of those questions that shows you why you need that relationship with God's word. Because the truth is, this is a verse that I don't feel like we ever hear, and I think it's an important verse. And it hit me years ago. I wrote an article about it, um, on our website, Everyday Apostolic. And it's just one thing that I think has helped a lot of people, and it's helped me to understand things that I've had questions about. Because God knew, again, God knows. And he used the Bible, he used this word to say, I'm going to put the answers to the questions you'll have in it. But what we have to do to get those answers is to be willing to read the word. And so if we look at Isaiah chapter 57, verses 1 through 2, I think we see... One of the greatest mysteries that we wonder is, God, why do the good die young? Why do you take good people and have them die? In Isaiah 57, 1 through 2 says, The righteous man perishes, and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away, while no one understands it. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. And that's a little bit hard to understand even in the ESV, but if we look at it in the NLT, I think it becomes open. And so that same passage again says, Blessings, or this is what the Lord says. It did not, how did it do that? Well, that's just weird, guys. I'm not even going to cut this out because I do want this podcast to be real. And I, I literally, that's why I paused for a moment there. Is I was thinking like, well, do I need to go through and change this up? But somehow... I tried to record that. Somehow in Logos, when I try to somehow download a Bible verse, it completely messes them up. And I don't understand it, but I've got it pulled up now. And so in that same passage says, Good people pass away, the godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. For those who follow godly paths will rest in peace when they die. We look at people who are dying and we think that well, God, they were so good, why did you take them? And that's exactly why God does take some people. And it can feel as though it's before their time, but what God sees is the calamity that awaits them, and God doesn't want them to have to face trials, struggles, and perils more. But he wants to provide them with the blessing of heaven, with the blessing of eternal life in a place where there is no sadness, no more sorrow. God grants people a blessing sometimes in death. And that's exactly what can happen. When we look at good people, even good, saved people who know God, love God, and are serving God, and they die, and we wonder, God, why did they have to die? It was a blessing to them. And it's a blessing we're never going to understand because we don't see what would have happened if they didn't pass on. But God is being good. God is blessing them. And that's what we have to understand. God gives us answers like this. That's a tough question. And even when we look at it in the Bible, it can be tough to understand still. And it doesn't, I'm not trying to, 
take away anybody's sorrow, but I want you to understand the kind of things that God has baked into his word, that God has made sure we can understand. I've heard people like try to argue, well, God's word can't have an answer for everything, but I truly believe it can. I believe that you can find every answer to what you need to know in the Bible, in God's word, if you're willing to look for it and if you're taking the time to read it and develop a relationship with it. And the reason that God can do this is because this isn't simply man's word. I know that there is a lot of people in the world today that will tell you, oh, well, the Bible's just a bunch of, you know, what people wrote down over history, or it's fantasy, or it's this or that. But the truth of the matter is, this is God's word. And we see that 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 explains what the Bible is to us. And it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness. It's God's word. It's what God spoke to people that God wanted you to know. And that's interesting to think about is because God doesn't make mistakes. And so when we look at the Bible, we realize that it has everything that God wanted us to have, nothing more and nothing less. God didn't write the Bible and go back and think, oh, man, I really should have put this in there. No, God had it right from the beginning. and He gave exactly the right messages to people at the right time to record from him so that we could have it today, rely on it, and be reproved, corrected, and led in righteousness. So we could be trained how to live a righteous lifestyle that honors God and brings glory unto his name. That's what God did in the Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've written an article or even I've done one of these podcasts, even even taught a Bible study, and you get to the end of it and you're like, man, I wish that I had had this verse back then. I wish I had remembered this verse or that I had read this when I was teaching that lesson. But God didn't do that. God already gave us exactly what we need. God doesn't have any remorse about what he gave us in the Bible, but the Bible is his perfected word, and it's what he delivered and what he wanted you to know. And the interesting thing about it is I see the Bible not just as this collection of books. The Bible's amazing. It's 66 books. It was written over thousands of years. It had multiple different authors, and they all wrote a story. Or wrote a story writ, that was my Southern coming out. They all wrote a story that connects together and that helps us to understand God, who he is, and what he desires for us and of us. And they wrote this story that aligns perfectly together. But in doing so, it's more than just that collection of writings given by God. It's his love message to his people. Now, I've talked about in a previous podcast episode, the book of Revelation, and how I see it as a letter of love from God. Because if God did not love us, then he would have let us blindly walk towards destruction. He would have let us live a life that leads to hell, that leads to peril. And he wouldn't have warned us about the future that awaits those who don't know him. But God didn't do that. God took the time to inspire a man to write the book of Revelation, giving him visions, giving him understanding of the times that are to come, all so that he could bless us, because he loves us. God loves us so much that he wants us to have his word and his truth so that we don't have to face the perils and the trousers of this world. But that's not just about Revelation. It's the entire Bible that God has given us so that we can experience his love and see his love. And it's only in the Bible that you can really begin to see and understand the full picture of God's love. Those people today who question the love of God, who say that God can't love for this reason or for that reason, they've never read the Bible in its fullness. They've never took the time to actually study through the Scriptures and to see what God has to say for himself, but they've taken the words of other people who don't know God and have applied those to their own lives in a way that's sadly jaded them against God. But if we take the time to read the Bible, that's when we see love. We see love baked throughout the whole book, explaining to us things that are to come and trying to help us to not face the worst that is yet to come. And I hope that, if anything, you'll read the Bible so that you don't have to face those things, that you can live a better life, that you'll know God. That's the kind of things that you can get from the Bible. And what's interesting is that the Bible tells us why God's even tarried, right? I think there's people like, well, you've been saying God's coming forever. Why hasn't he came yet? What's interesting is that Peter had that same question apparently posed to him a lot, because in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So it seems to me like 
not even 30 years after Jesus had died on the cross, people were like, well, when's this Jesus going to come back? And Peter had to make it clear to him from them, or clear to them from then, that the reason that Jesus hadn't yet come back for the church is because he wanted more people to be saved. He wanted to see as many people saved as possible. And that still stands true today. I think that that verse should be our response. When we have, you know, um, unbelievers, atheists, whatever, come at us and they want to argue and say, like, well, you've been saying all this time that Jesus is coming back. Why isn't he coming back in? It's like, well, Jesus loves you so much that he's putting off his return to try to see as many people like you saved as possible. God wants to know you, wants a relationship with you, and he's waiting as long as he can to have as many relationships with as many people as possible because he loves them. That's what God does, and that's the kind of truth that we get from the Bible. And we're also told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-4, through 4, that this is good and pleasing sight in the God of our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. God loves all people, and he desires that all people would come to know him, that would come to the knowledge of life-saving truth from God. That's what he desires. And the purpose of all these books of the Bible is so that we'll just know God better, that we can love him, and that we can serve him, and that we can be blessed by him. That's what God is all about, and that's what his word is all about. And I think that that's really why it's so important that we read the Bible. And that's what's going to give us the best understanding. Because the truth of the matter is, is I can tell you about God, someone else can tell you about God, but you're never going to truly know God unless you read the Bible. In the Bible, we get the full picture. It's almost like somebody describing a painting to you, and then you see the painting. That's what it is when I try to share this with you. I think it's so important that Christian podcasts exist, that Christian YouTubers exist, that we do as much content as we can as we try to help other Christians or other people even that don't know God, connect with God. But there's still something different about doing it yourself. And if you go to read the Bible yourself, that's when you get to have the full picture of God. And it's only in the Bible that we can see God in his fullness, that we can see every aspect, every facet of God is what we can find within his own word, what he said about himself and what he really wants us to know about himself. God wants us to know him. He wants us to know things about him. But the only way that we're ever going to be able to do that is by taking the time to read his word, see what he said about himself. And that's when we begin to see how God has unlimited capacity, how God has unlimited ability, how God can do things that we can't understand. I think what we struggle with as Christians a lot, or just as people a lot, maybe even if you don't know God in this moment, we want to look at God as though he was like us. But it's when we begin to read the Bible and we study his word that we see that God isn't like us. We may be created in the image of God, but we get a small portion of what God is because God can do so much more than we can. God is the ultimate forgiver. God can do anything and not hold a grudge. You know, as the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That shows us that God is able to do what we can't. God is able to forgive in ways that we can't. God is able to bless in ways that we can't. And one thing that I always think about is because I've been blessed to work with some of the fastest computers in the world. And what you learn when you work with those computers is that scientists will tell you no matter how fast the computers get, they will always be able to max them out. But God doesn't work that way. God can't be maxed out. And that's what we see in Scripture. Nowhere are we told in Scripture that we shouldn't pray about this, that we shouldn't do that, that that God can't handle that much, that God can become overwhelmed. But what we see is that God has an infinite scale. He can scale to any amount. God can hear the prayers of all 8 billion people on this planet at one time, and he's not going to become overwhelmed by it. And not only that, but the Bible tells us that the hairs on our head are all numbered. I don't know how many hairs are on my head. I've not done that Google search. But what I can tell you is it's a lot. And God knows how many hairs I have, how many hairs you have, how many hairs my wife has. He knows how many hairs every person on this planet has. He knows exactly the number because God can know all things. In the Bible, we can begin to see who God is, what he is, what he does, how he loves, how he acts, and how we should act in response and under the example that he gives us. We may not be able to do the exact same things that God does because we're not God, and that's an important thing to understand, but. That doesn't mean that we can't try to be our best and follow in the example of our Lord. And Jesus is an example to us. The Bible tells us to follow in the example of Jesus. And Paul says to follow his example as he follows Christ. It's a good thing. But the only way we'll know how to do that even is if we look 
closely at what God did and what Jesus did in the flesh while he was here on earth. You know, we're called to be disciples, and disciples are someone dedicated to the teaching of the person who they've claimed to be a disciple of. I made that a weird sentence, but a disciple is somebody who, who follows the teaching of the one they claim to be a disciple of. Well, we have the teaching of Jesus within the Bible. If we're trying to be a disciple of Jesus, we should be looking at what he taught. I don't want you to be a disciple of me. You shouldn't be a disciple of Paul. We should be a disciple of God. And the way that we become the disciple of God is by seeing God's word, about reading God's word, having it applied in our lives. We need that relationship with God's word. God's word. What we have to realize in this is that God doesn't give us things that we don't need. The reason that we have the Bible, the reason that we have Scripture, is because we need it. God has given us the Bible to be a help, to be an encouragement, to be an uplifting, and we need it in our lives. God didn't give us the opportunity to pray because, or to pray because we don't need to pray. He gave us prayer because he knew that we would need to be connected with him. And the same is true with our Bible, the same is true with worship, and the same is true with all other manner of things in our lives. We need that connection with God, and that's exactly why God gave us his word. But if you're not reading the Bible, then you're not going to have that connection, you're not going to have an understanding, and you're not going to have what you need. Does that mean you won't be saved? No. It doesn't say that the plan of salvation is repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, and receive the Holy Ghost, and read your Bible. But that doesn't mean that reading the Bible is also not important. We shouldn't weigh everything on is it a salvation issue, but we should weigh everything on what's best for us. Is this going to help me? The Bible tells us not everything is good for you, even though it's not unlawful, right? The Bible says that just because something's not sinful doesn't mean that you should do it. You shouldn't focus on what am I allowed to do, but what's beneficial for me. And we don't spend enough time doing that. The truth of the matter is the Bible is extremely beneficial for our lives, and that's why it should get a higher pole position in our lives. The time that we spend on TikTok, television, YouTube, the time that we spend doing things that don't matter, that aren't beneficial for my life, sadly outweighs the time that we ought to be spending things that are beneficial for our life. We need to step back. We need to look and find what is going to improve our lives and make it better, and that is the Bible. The Bible is going to bless you. The Bible is going to, you're not going to read the Bible and think, man, that wasn't worth my time. But you're going to read the Bible and you're going to learn things about God, and it's going to help you build your trust in God. And a lot of people today are lacking trust in God. That's why they can pray and still be worried. That's why they're worried about the basic necessities of life, even though God said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Talking about food, talking about clothing, talking about your basic necessities. God said, I'm going to give those to you if you'll seek me first. Yet people are still nervous and still worried about it, and it's because they don't have a trust-built relationship with God, and you're never going to have that without the Bible. Now, you need prayer, you need church attendance, you need those other things, but you need the Bible. You need to see how God has provided for others and to see the verse that says that God has no favorites, that God doesn't pick and choose people. And when you put those things together, you begin to see that if God did it for them, he'll do it for me too. That's why you need the Bible. It's to build your faith in God, to build your trust in God, and to rely on him more and more. I can't tell you how impactful it is to me to read like the book of Acts and to see how the early church lived, how they operated, and how they believed in ways that we so often don't believe. I have another podcast I want to do. I think it's going to be the next one after this that talks about the prayers that we ought to be praying. And what you see in their prayers is that they don't pray for some of the stuff that we pray for today. But what they prayed for was spiritual needs, getting closer to God, doing what they needed to, and really crucifying the flesh so they could continue on the path that they were on, doing more of what they were already doing for God. But so often what our prayers are about are about finances, are about clothing, or about food, and it's not that we shouldn't pray for those things and we worry about it, but we shouldn't become so consumed with that that we don't take the time to pray for what really matters. And we can't see what really matters, again, unless we see it in God's Word. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things. That's something else that the Bible tells us, and it's going to lead us astray. If we follow our heart, we're going to be led away from God. And so we can't think that we can figure out God on our own. The only way we're going to figure out God and figure out the life he wants us to live is by taking the time to get in his word, read his word, understand his word, and apply it in our lives. And that's why the Bible is so important. I hope that you can see that the Bible is everything. The Bible is that cornerstone. It's that linchpin. It's that thing that we need in order to live our lives right. The Bible can change your life and make it. I know it's true in my life. The Bible's changed it more than anything else. The reason I'm here today 
is because I found God, obviously, but it's changed my life reading the Bible. When you read the Bible, it shows you where you need to be better. It shows you how you need to improve and maybe even where you're not doing enough, a situation that I have definitely found myself in before. And what really inspired this podcast is this verse I want to read to you here from Joshua. And I think this is what everything started from and stemmed from, but it showed me a need for the word. Now, obviously, Joshua didn't live in the same dispensation of grace that we live in now. He lived under the law. He didn't even have the full Bible. But it's interesting to read what God told Joshua. So in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, God said, Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the left hand or, or sorry, do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you may have good success wherever you go. It's funny to read that verse because I think a lot of Christians think like, well, as long as I don't go too far left, if you know what I mean, then I'm going to be fine. But the truth of the matter is we can go too far right also. And you can look at that in political context as I kind of joked about, about going left. But the truth of the matter is we need to be centered in God. And the way that we find the center, that we don't you know, lose things in the faith and go one direction, or we don't go way too far and lean too heavily in another direction that makes what would be righteous unrighteous because of the way that we treat it, we need to find that center line. And the thing that I think really connects this is the fact that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those are few that find it. So the way to life and heaven is a narrow path, and the alternative is a wide path. Well, it sounds to me like that the, the, the narrow path would be kind of in the middle. And that if we go one direction this way or we go one direction that way, we have stepped off that path. We need that thing that guides our course, that keeps us centered. And prayer is a part of that. And we've talked a lot about prayer recently, but we also need the Bible. We don't need, we can't just look at the Bible and say like, well, I'll either pray or read the Bible. We're not, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have that option. But scripture tells us to pray and to read the Bible. And so that we will, that's what we ought to do. That's how we ought to look at things. That's how we ought to see this world, we should look at it through the lens of Scripture, and we should realize there's a narrow gate, and I want to be on that narrow path to get to the narrow gate. I don't want to be distracted by these things to the left or to the right. I need what's going to keep me centered and keep me on the right path, and that is the Bible. That is the Word of God. It's what's going to keep you on that path. Now, like I said, we live in that different dispensation, and so we're not really looking at living according to the law, but that doesn't mean that we can live however we want to. I'm glad that God sent Jesus, that Jesus died for our sins, and that we don't have to live under that strict obedience to the law anymore. But that doesn't mean we have a free pass to simply live however we want to live. The truth of the matter is, is that we still have to live a good lifestyle. We still can't live these sinful lifestyles. We don't need to be deceived by the world, you could say, and that really aligns with the verse that I want to read with you in a second. But a lot of people today are going to tell you like, oh, well, you don't have to do that or you don't have to do this to be saved. But it's interesting that when you know the Bible, you know that that's not true, that there are certain ways that God expects us to live. Even though we are saved by grace alone and not by works, there are still differences in how we are to live as the redeemed than how we were living before we came to new Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11 says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immorality, sorry, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Do not be deceived. I think that's the really important verse here, and that's the truth of the matter is that people are going to try to deceive you. And we'll look at some of that a little bit more later. But people are telling you that, oh, you don't have to do that, you don't have to do this. No, there are certain ways you're supposed to live. And the way that you can best see that is in the Bible. Yes, you have a pastor. Yes, God has given the fivefold ministry of teachers, pastors, evangelists, all these things that are helpful. But, but 
they can only teach you so much. They only have so much time, and their messages have to be prepared for people who don't know God at all. They have to preach specific messages at different times to help different people in different stages of life in different places with religion. And when you need to get deeper with God's Word and with the Bible, that means that it's sometimes you're going to have to find the answers for yourself. And that's why God gave us the Bible. We should be willing to do this. We should be willing to read God's Word and to see that full picture and that full example. And another thing that Paul said that I think really nails this home is he's dealing with the issue of sin. And people are saying to him in Romans, in chapter 6, He's addressing people that are like, well, if, if grace abounds through sin, should I just sin all the more? And in chapter, or sorry, chapter 6, verse 2, he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin live in it? We can't continue to live in sin if we've died to sin. That's an important verse that I don't think we know often, and we're not going to know it in many cases unless we actually read the Bible, guys. That's my whole point for us in this, and I hope that you can see that. I'm trying to get you to understand why you need to read the Bible, that you need the Scripture, that you need to apply it in your life. We thankfully don't have to have that strict obedience, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a certain way that we need to live. And the truth is that we need to be prepared and have the right response for the world around us. Because I think that a lot of what we see today is the enemy trying to strip Christians up, trying to make us respond in a certain way. The enemy wants us to respond hatefully, mean, and arrogant about certain issues in our world, and sadly, many Christians are falling into that. And I think it's because they don't have the right view of God's Word or even the right understanding of God's Word. But if we can understand God's Word, if we can begin to grow in our understanding of truth and our relationship with God's Word, we can see how we're supposed to respond in certain situations. And what it really comes down to is the Bible tells us to be humble, to be gentle, to be kind, and to be patient. And the world is hoping that we'll be mean, hateful, arrogant, and boastful. And the truth is, a lot of people end up on that path. They don't realize that, yes, these people are living in sin. Yes, they're doing things to get a reaction out of you. But God has told us already how to have the right response and what the right response is and what it looks like. And so we can find that right response when we need it in God's Word. That's one of those reasons that we need the Bible is to tell us how to respond in every single circumstance. And the truth, what it really comes down to is being gentle, kind, patient, loving, and just exercising what God has already given us. Because God didn't be, God didn't act rude and boastful and rude and mean to us when we were lost in our sins, and we shouldn't do that to those who are still lost in their sins today. But that's not easy, and it takes prayer, and it takes sacrifice, and it takes developing that relationship with God's Word. But if we can do that, that's what gives others a better view of God's Word. When we're rude, it doesn't show people who God is. It shows them who sinful people are. But they get the wrong mindset of God, and they get the wrong mindset of God's Word. But if we could live out God's Word in its fullness and its truth, because we actually know God's Word, because we've read God's Word, then I believe God would be better spoken of in our world today. And I really hope that this is hitting home with you. You need to read the Bible. It's so hard to be a Christian without reading the Bible. It's not going to be the life that you want. And I think we can see something similar to this in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It's actually following the verse that we read earlier from Joshua, but it says, The book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. I love those kind of if-then statements in the Bible, those ones that really help people like me to understand, like, okay, well, if I do this, then this is what's going to happen. And that's exactly what God's telling Joshua. If you continue in my word all the time, if you remind yourself of it, if you live in it, then you will not depart from it. And not only that, but your way will be made prosperous. I think the same thing is true today in terms of what our Bible is. If we will take the time to read the Bible in the morning, to read the Bible even at night, to meditate on what the Bible says, not allow it to depart from us, then our ways are going to be prosperous. It's much easier to live according to God's Word the more time you spend in God's Word. But you're going to struggle to live God's Word if you never know what God's Word actually says. And I'll be honest, I've been reading the Bible now every day for the last, I don't know, eight years. And 
it's never gets boring for one, but it also helps you to grow and helps you to get better at what you're living. The reminders I have now in scripture that remind me of like, oh, I don't need to do this because this is what God's word says, or, you know, this, those things that guide us in God's word is because I've reinforced it time and time again. We need the reinforcement. We need to grow in it. Yes, there are a lot of other books out there. There's a lot of great books. I've got books right behind me here on the shelf. They're all great, but they're not the Bible. We, did, we should be spending more time, honestly, I feel like, in the Bible than even in other books, even in commentaries. There's a place and a time for books like commentaries. There's even a place and a time for fiction. But there's a daily place and time for the Bible. And that's what we should be spending our time in. That's what's important. And that's what's going to help us to live this life in a way that results in the blessings of eternal life in heaven that I believe we all desire and that we're all seeking after. But it's going to be so much easier to get to that place if we actually take the time to know God's word for ourselves. But I've saved what I think is one of the biggest points for last and something that I think you need to really understand. And it's something that we all realize today more than ever, thanks to TV evangelists and all these things, there are a lot of false teachers out there. There's a lot of people who are twisting God's word and God's message just to try to get your money, to try to get your attention, and to try to get you to be focused on them and not as much on God. But we can circumvent these people. We can get around these people. We can know how to identify these people if we spend time in God's Word. And that's why it's important to know God's Word, because we won't be able to identify these people unless we are able to see them through Scripture. And so we need to take the time to see that, to focus on it, and to grow in it so we don't get led astray. Because the truth of the matter is, there are going to be many people who were Christians that get led astray by sinful teachers in this world in the last days, of which I believe we could be seen and living in right now. And if that's true, then we need to be in the Bible so that we aren't deceived. We can't trust everybody, and they're going to be good at what they do. They're going to be good at deceiving and leading astray, and so that's why we need to know God's Word. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 18, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So there's going to be these wolves, and they're going to be dressed in sheep's clothing. They're going to look good, but they're not going to produce good fruit. And you should be able to see that they're not producing good fruit by looking at their life. But the truth of the matter is you'll never recognize good fruit from bad fruit unless you have the example of the good fruit and the bad fruit. And that's found in the Bible. We may see things that we think are good, and we may see things that we think are bad, but still that's being led by our own determinations unless we have it straight from God's Word. It's God's Word is the source by which we compare all things, and that includes the biblical teachers that we allow in our lives. And if you know the Bible, you're not going to be deceived. You're not going to be led astray by someone who's living a sinful lifestyle. And the sad truth is that those who are following teachers today that are false and aren't true are doing so because they don't have God's Word as the guiding post but they're willing to accept any teaching that comes their way. And what it really is an example of is what we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3-4. through 4. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The truth of the matter is this. Our flesh doesn't like God's word. It likes our own worldly thoughts, worldly ideas. It likes the philosophies of men. And so that's what our ears are itching after. That's what's going to soothe what we want to hear. The Bible isn't always what we want to hear. And so when these teachers come and they begin to tell us what we want to hear over what we need to hear, that's when we can be deceived. But when we've looked into the perfect law of righteousness, which is in the Bible, and then we see them coming, we will see clearly the differences between what they teach and what the word teaches and we can know without a shadow of a doubt that if their word differs from this word that they're a false teacher that they're false doctrine and that we need to do everything we can to get away from them and so that's why being in the bible is so important if you're not in this book you are setting yourself up to be led astray by those who are going to feed you lies and feed you what you want to hear instead of the truth from the scripture that you need to hear 
And so that's why if you develop a relationship with his word, you are doing something to protect yourself of what God has already told us is coming in the Bible. He told us these false teachers would come because that's what has to happen. That's what the devil is going to do to try to do everything he can to win in the last days. But if we dedicate ourselves to God and spend time in his word, then we are eliminating that way for the devil to win because we are so enveloped in what God has already said that we cannot be deceived. We are using what God has given us, the guiding light he has provided, in order to stay on that right narrow path. And so that way we can be protected everywhere we go. This Bible is going to help us in those ways. And there's another verse, and I don't have it in my notes, but it's when Paul went to teach to the Bereans. And he writes how they were so righteous and so good. But what's interesting about what they did is even when Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wrote most of our New Testament. And what's amazing is that even when he came to them, they still went back and they searched through their Old Testament scriptures to see if what he taught about Jesus being the Messiah was true and was accurate. And what they found is that it was. And they're, comp- they're, they're recorded in the Bible as being righteous for doing so. We can be righteous for doing so today if we take even a good teacher's word and just make sure that what they said was actually there. And it's important that we do. Because these are important things. These are life and death issues. Life and death matters. And so we should be spending time in the Bible and even taking what we're taught and just making sure, is that actually in the Bible? Is it in the right context? Is it what God's Word actually intends and actually says? There's nothing wrong with doing that. But it's only going to provide blessings in your life, and it's only going to make sure that you stay on the right path. Now, I could keep sitting here, I could really sit here all day and tell you countless, countless reasons as to why you need to be reading the Bible. But the simple truth of the matter is this, is if you're not reading the Bible, you're going to struggle to live for God. It's going to be harder. It's not going to be what it could be. And the truth of the matter is that if you're not in God's Word, then it's hard to even know who God really is. And I could tell you everything that's in the Bible. But it's not going to change the fact that you need to read it for yourself because it's going to connect with you better. You're going to understand it better. It's going to be more applicable in your life. You're going to have an easier time remembering it and applying it. And it's going to be more impactful when you see it in God's word for yourself. And what I want you to understand is that God wants you to know his word. He's not going to try to hide it from you or mask it from you. Now, I do think it's worth saying that receiving the Holy Ghost makes reading the Bible so much easier. If you've not actually received the Holy Ghost, I've got a whole episode on that called Have You Received the Holy Ghost Since You Believed? Go back and watch that if you don't think that you have. But when you receive the Holy Ghost, it makes reading the Bible so much easier. And not only that, but prayer makes the Bible easier to read. If you're struggling to read the Bible or struggling to understand your subjects, pray about it. The Bible says that God will give you wisdom. And I think that he will give you wisdom in terms of the Scripture as well and help you to understand what his Word means. And he doesn't just give it sparingly, but he gives it plentiful, liberally, is what the Bible says, is how he provides wisdom to those who need it. It's a free gift from God that when we ask for it, he is willing to provide and willing to meet us where we are. So read the Bible. Take the time to know it. You need to read it for yourself. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to know God to the best of your ability, read the Bible. I'm not trying to cause you shame. I'm not trying to cause you to feel bad. I'm trying to cause you to find the greatest blessing that you ever will. Yes. You can be a Christian without reading the Bible, but you're going to find things harder and you're going to have a lot more questions. But as soon as you begin to develop that daily relationship with the Bible, then you will have all that you need and you'll have the questions that you've been wondering about answered for you, not by some person, but by God himself, which I've always found to be a much greater blessing. I've had a lot of people answer me questions and a lot of those answers have stuck with me. But there's something different about when God answers the question. Now, if you're wondering about how you can read the Bible and how you can start, I recommend starting in one of the the Gospels, Matthew, John, Mark, or Luke. Uh, A lot of people like to start in John. I love the book of Matthew. You may want to skip through the genealogy, but that's a great place to start. And again, pray before you read the Bible, pray while you read the Bible, and pray after you read the Bible. Incorporate prayer into your time reading the Bible and just seek God's guidance and God's help in reading it. And also, don't try to read a ton at one time. Start small. The Bible is referred to as the bread of life. We need time to digest. And so if you're going to read the Bible, I highly recommend you do, but maybe start at just one chapter. 
read through one chapter for the day, close your Bible and come back the next day and read another chapter. And as you grow in your ability and your understanding and even your retention, then you begin you can begin to read as much of the Bible as you want. But it's not a marathon. Or no, it's not a it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. If you want to read the entire Bible, you can easily get burnt out by reading too much of it at one time. And that's not going to help you. But if you slowly build up into it, that's going to help you. You know, they talk about running. And if you want to start running, they recommend that you run 15 seconds, walk 30 seconds. And you continue to do that until it gets easy. And then you build up. And maybe you run 30 seconds and walk 30 seconds. But there's a time. And it seems like it's not working and that you're not developing fast enough. But it's giving you what you need so that way you don't get hurt and that you don't burn out. And that's the very same thing is true when it comes to reading your Bible. I don't want you to get burnt out, but I want you to have that real relationship with God. So start small, work up to it, and just get better over time. And as you get more comfortable, and as you have that more of a desire to read the Bible, then go ahead and do it. But make sure you come back to it daily. There's something about having that daily relationship with the Word to where you can receive from God. And I know that it can bless your life. I hope that you found this episode impactful today and helpful. If you have questions about the Bible, if you have questions about reading the Bible, if you have concerns about anything or a subject that you would like us to talk about in a future episode of the podcast, you can leave it in the comments or you can email us at moregodlessmepodcast at gmail.com. That'll be a link in the description as well. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you about these things. And I do, again, hope that this has helped you read the Bible. If it has, then please consider subscribing because we've got more content coming out all the time. I also ask that you would like, comment, all those good things, and that you would even consider sharing it with people you know that also need to develop a better relationship with the Bible and with God's Word. We believe that this can bless them. We believe it can help them. But we can't reach them as easily without your help. And so we pray you would help us to grow this platform and reach more people with solid biblical truth that will help them live a better life for Christ. Until we see you guys in the next episode, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And God bless.